Um, I'm going to go back to something you said about uh, in the film, the integration of the quantum and um, the, uh, the the neurology and that sort of the biology part. Because people, we purposely in, in the film kind of left that vague so that people could put it together for themselves. And they're very interested in the science behind that. How would you see? Th how do you see them fitting together? Well, you, you did a very nice job in fitting them together in one way in the film. And that is both really see both of these disciplines, modern quantum physics and molecular biology, neuroimmunology, they both say that we do create our own realities and that we have a lot of responsibility over the world in which we live, at least the way we experience the world and the way the world behaves towards us. That's a very good connection, actually. That was brilliant. Uh, ultimately, what we'd like to see is what is the physics of consciousness? We can ask that question today. What is consciousness? Where does it come from? What are the origins of consciousness? What are the limits of human potential? We're in a position to actually answer that now, I believe, although there's certainly not consensus yet in the scientific community about that. But with the real cutting edge knowledge, the discovery of the unified field, the so-called superstring field, we now understand that life is fundamentally one at the basis of all life's diversity, there is unity. At our basis, you and I are one. And that unity at the basis of mind and matter is consciousness, universal consciousness. So with that deep understanding that consciousness isn't created by the brain, it's not purely an outcome of molecular chemical processes in the brain, but is fundamental in nature. It's the very core of nature. We call it the unified field. Now that we have that foundational understanding of what consciousness is, we can solve the mind-body problem. We can see how consciousness percolates up through our physiology to become the consciousness that we experience and see and sensory perception and all of that. So there is a foundation now to really link rigorously neuroscience with quantum physics. That might be really a next step in the development of the movie. You've asked the questions in the first movie. Now we're just on the verge of being able to answer those questions. So you mentioned the unified field. For people who never, a lot of people are going, well, that sounds nice. It's unified. Everything's one. Could you dive a little more technically into what the unified field is? Progress in our understanding of the universe through physics over the past quarter century has been exploring deeper levels of natural law from the macroscopic to the microscopic, from the molecular to the atomic to the nuclear to subnuclear levels of nature's functioning, so-called electroweak unified scale, grand unified scale, super unified scale. And what we've discovered at the core basis of the universe, the foundation of the universe, is a single universal field of intelligence, a field which unites gravity with electromagnetism, light, with radioactivity, with the nuclear force, so that all the forces of nature and all the so-called particles of nature, quarks, leptons, protons, neutrons, are now understood to be one. They're all just different ripples on a single ocean of existence. That's called the unified field or superstring field. And it's a mathematical tour de force. But we have realized Einstein's dream. He dedicated half of his life to discovering this unified field. And now in the context of the superstring, that has been achieved. So unified field theories based on the superstring identify a single universal field of intelligence, an ocean of existence at the basis of everything, mind and matter. And all the so-called particles of the universe, the forces in our universe, everything in the universe are just ripples of on that ocean of existence. That's the unified field. And that field is, not, is a non-material field. It is ultimately the field of consciousness. And all our separate consciousness, wherever there's consciousness, is merely consciousness by virtue of the fact that my consciousness, your consciousness, are ultimately that. Everything in the universe is really nothing but that. Planets, trees, people, animals, we're all just waves of vibration of this underlying unified superstring field. We are really united at our core. And ultimately, the understanding that's emerging will be that there is only one consciousness in this room. And it is you. And it is me. And it is each and every one of us. We individualize our consciousness through the filter of our nervous system. But the consciousness itself our very inner subjectivity, 
the self in the big sense, that is universal. And knowing that, ex knowing it through experience, is called enlightenment and has been called enlightenment through the ages. It sounds like you're going down through the, the physical realms, leptons, you know, smaller, smaller, and you're saying at the base, it's not solid, it's intelligence. Why do you use the word intelligence? That is a very brilliant question. It, what you're saying really reflects a bias that all of us share. Everyone who's grown up in the scientific world is used to the concept that we're living in a material universe, an inert universe, a universe of dead matter. And because of that, <clears throat> it's difficult instinctively to grasp that we're not really living in a dead universe, that the universe is overwhelmingly conscious at its basis. See, what we have seen and studied for 300 years of classical physics is what we call billiard ball mechanics, macroscopic physics, classical physics, the physics of billiard balls, cannonballs, and planets. But quantum mechanics, even at the molecular level, let alone atomic, nuclear, subnuclear, in the realm of quantum mechanics, the idea of particle is replaced by the idea of wave function. And what is a wave function? Technically, it's a vector in a linear space. But what's a vector in a linear space? What's it made of? What's the substance of nature? Well, a wave function, a vector in a linear space, is made of the same stuff thoughts are made of. We're li really living in a thought universe, a conceptual universe. Quantum mechanics is just the play and display of potentiality. So the point I'm making is the deeper you go in the structure of natural law, the less material, the less inert, the less dead the universe is, the more alive, the more conscious the universe becomes. Then when you get to the foundation of the universe, the unified field or superstring field, it's simply a field of pure, being, pure intelligence. Intelligence because it's the fountainhead of all the laws of nature, all the fundamental forces, all the fundamental particles, all the laws governing life at every level of the universe have their unified source in the unified field. That makes the unified field the most concentrated field of intelligence in nature, non-material, dynamic, self-aware intelligence. Those are the properties of the unified field. Could you also use the term, because um, I've read this someplace, some people were saying at the bottom, it's also um, information. Is that kind of similar, or is that another way to describe the same thing? It's very similar. I'd say the quantum world, quantum mechanics, is really the play and display of information, the play and display of potentiality, waves of information, waves of potential electron. And it's important, the word potential. This isn't the world of electrons, it's the world of potential electrons. But when you have, you have to ask the question, waves of what, really? What is the field that is waving? Is it the ocean? <laughs> no, it's a universal ocean, an ocean of pure potentiality, an ocean of abstract potential existence. We call it the unified field, or superstring field. And that's what we're made of. So, as you said, the tighter physics have tried to grasp on to physical reality, to understand what it's really made of, what are the core building blocks of life at the basis of it all. Life, the universe, slips through your fingers, and you come up with something that's increasingly abstract, increasingly abstract, to the come to the realm of pure abstraction. And that's what the unified field is. It's pure abstract potential, pure abstract being, pure abstract self-aware consciousness, which rises in waves of vibration to give rise to the particles, the people, everything we see in the vast universe. That was great. I got, I got awesome. goosebumps on that one. <laughs>
Very interesting. In order to transcend to experience unbounded awareness, consciousness has to settle down completely. Now, if you try and reproduce that experience, you'll never succeed because trying involves effort and effort keeps the awareness active and the comprehension from expanding. That's why a very delicate technique is involved and personal instruction is involved. It's easy, it's natural, but it's delicate. And it's easy to lose it. And I'm afraid it has been lost completely. It's being revitalized again and again throughout history. Of course, Maharshi's own life is dedicated to teaching as many people as possible how to transcend and regain that experience. But unfortunately, we have a society with a certain momentum. We have generations of teachers who've gone to teachers' education or members of teachers' unions that don't always support educational innovation. So it may take a generation, unfortunately, it may take a generation now that simple techniques, universal, non-sectarian, scientifically verified techniques exist to gain enlightenment, it still may take a generation before these life-saving technologies to develop consciousness are reintroduced into education. You said non-sectarian. Does that mean like non-religious? Is that what that you mean by that? Um, the, the, the experience of pure consciousness really transcends any one religion or any one philosophy. It's as scientific as it is religious. It is, after all, a state of functioning of the brain, maximally expanded comprehension. It's the direct subjective experience of the scientifically discovered unified field of all the laws of nature. Is that religious? Perhaps, but it's scientific too. So there's no reason that it should be disbarred from education. Otherwise, we're going to get the same old result. 5% development of our mental potential, another generation of war and terrorism and human cruelty. And that'll go on forever until the experience of life's essential unity is bestowed and the brain is properly developed. You know, we talked to we yeah. talked to Jeffrey Satinover and uh, and and Hammeroff, and I think maybe one other physicist said the same thing that because you talk a lot about the observer, and they sort of said that the observe that whole concept of the observer was a mistake, and it's been fixed, and it doesn't really mean anything now. What about that? It's true. There's a deeper level of perspective in which the observer does not yet exist, not separate from the observed. The reality of life today is all unity. Unified field which unites observer and observed in one indivisible wholeness. Scientifically, we call, it, we call it quantum measurement theory and the ultimate inseparability of the observer from the observed. In the language and science of consciousness, we call it the unity of knower and known in the indivisible structure of pure knowledge, the experience of oneself, the Atman. And what is the self? The self, consciousness, our very subjectivity, is that one thing in our life that has never changed. Intangible that, though it may be, and very difficult to put your finger on, it's that one aspect of our experience that has been with us since childhood. Although our beliefs have changed, our friends have changed, our bodies have changed, typically for the worse, that one thing that gives that continuity to our experience day by day, that's our consciousness. It's our subjectivity. It's the Atman, the self. And that self, which is the same for you as for me, ultimately, is this unified field discovered by science, which is essentially the creator of the universe. That is our authority. That's our dignity. If we only knew ourself and how precious it was, we would rush to experience higher states of consciousness where that experience of our unbounded subjectivity is never lost, even during the depths of sleep. understand. That's okay. I still don't understand. Let me, can I have you rephrase yeah. the question? Yeah, you, it's good. It wasn't a very clear I answer. Rephrase. I'm, I'm just telling you. What I don't understand is that some, some people over here, some of the scientists we spoke to, said, said the observer is not part of the equation anymore. Right. And yet, people like you are saying that focused intent affects matter. Right. I want to understand, I want to understand those two disparate views. Okay. Yeah, what he said. There are different truths because our universe is hierarchically structured in layers. The atomic has its own truth. The nuclear world has its own completely different truth. And they're both valid. They're both self-consistent. 
So there's the truth of diversity, where observer and observed are separately identifiable systems, and there's the deeper truth of unity, in which there is no separation between the observer and the observed. So we can talk about life at all levels. Each level is valid, but the deepest level in this scientific age is the level of unity. What has to be very clear about this is a concept most people don't get quite, and it's very important. You can drag me across the floor by my arm. You can drag me across, across the floor by my atoms, or by my nuclei, or by my cells. It all has the same effect. I get dragged across the floor. These are simply different levels of the description of the one reality that is me. So it's legitimate for us to talk about a world of diversity. We see such a world, after all. But it's even more legitimate for us also to talk about the world of unity, the ultimate scientific truth of life. So we get tripped up in semantics if we say that unity alone exists, but there's no such thing as diversity, or that diversity alone exists, there's no such thing as unity. They're both true. They're just different levels of description of the same reality. So, you know, you talk about me and you are one, but we're also separate. Those are just different levels. Different levels. On the physical level, you and I are separate. You're much better looking than I am, more attractive in virtually every way. But at deeper levels, we have a common source. And that is the unified field, the scientifically discovered unified field that is the source of you and the source of me, the source of gravity, the source of electromagnetism, the source of quarks, the source of leptons. Everything in the universe has a common source. So if we look at things at the deepest possible level, we ultimately discover one unified universal reality, of which you're a wave, of which I am a wave. We're all just the different vibrational frequencies, the natural reverberant frequencies of this one universal unified field. Our whole universe is just a symphony. The various, what, harmonics and fundamentals and overtones of one universal field, one universal ocean of consciousness in motion. So let me ask, I'm just trying to understand all this stuff. So does that place come from the Planck scale or is it? Yes. Wow, really, yes. I totally understand it for the first time. Oh my God, I'm so excited. <laughs> the, the Planck scale is that small, small distance scale, 10 million, million, million times smaller than the atomic nucleus, where all the forces come together, where all the particles come together as one, where you and I come together as one reality, where distance, where causality no longer exist, and there's one unified, indivisible wholeness, which is the unity of consciousness the unified field of all the laws of nature.